everyone and welcome to our third episode of Fertility Chat with Vita Lab. And today we are back in Santon and we are joined by Dr. Yossi today and we are discussing the, one of the most important parts of the fertility journey which is the womb itself. So thank you for um, joining us today and I look forward to our discussion. Thanks. Thank you Nadia. It's great to be part of this initiative and uh, yeah, wishing you lots of luck. Thank you so much. Okay, so Dr. Yossi, um, referring to the womb or the uterus, I know we've discussed the sperm and the eggs and all that parts of fertilities, but what complications do you see when it comes to the womb and wanting to have a baby? What are the different obstacles that come across your desk sometimes? And if you can tell us a bit more about that. Sure. So <clears throat> the, the interesting thing is that often the uterus plays a role in the infertility journey but is not necessarily the only reason for infertility. Mm -hmm. But there are certain conditions which we would say cause an absolute uterine factor, that this couple are not getting pregnant because of the uterus. And obviously when you've got absolute uterine factors, they can vary from cases which are really severe in a woman who develop, but develop without a uterus, and obviously their infertility journey would um, need to go along the lines of something like surrogacy. And then you get certain conditions where the uterus develops, but it develops abnormally. And in those cases, again, you would potentially have an absolute uterine factor that the eggs are fine, the sperm is fine, the tubes are fine, but the, the reason for the infertility is related solely to the uterus. And then we've got conditions where the uterus plays a role in the infertility. So there may be other factors. There may be a sperm factor or an egg factor. And because the uterus is not perfect, it also is not playing its role. And <clears throat> the interesting thing is that when we take a good strong embryo and we put it in a uterus that may have some problems, generally that embryo will find a way to implant. <clears throat> but when we've got poorer eggs, poorer sperm, and a uterus that has some pathology, then together combined, um, the, problem, the problem is much bigger. Okay, and can you give us some examples of those um what do you call it, problems that exist within the sure, womb? Sure, So you get certain subtle problems where you can have something as minimal as an inflammation in the lining of the uterus, something called an endometritis, which can reduce the embryo's ability to implant. Then you get things called polyps, which are benign overgrowths in the lining of the uterus. And a small polyp may not interfere with an embryo implanting in the uterus, but the bigger that polyp is, the more significant it would become in reducing an embryo's chances of implanting. So some couples will come and will find a big polyp in the uterus, we take it out and they fall pregnant naturally. Mm -hmm. Other couples may need IVF to fall pregnant for other reasons and also have a polyp in the uterus. And if you overlook that polyp mm -hmm. and you just go and do IVF and put the embryo in the uterus, you will have wasted a good embryo because it won't implant inside the uterus. Then we get things that affect the muscle of the uterus, things like fibroids, which are benign growths inside the muscle of the uterus. And fibroids do not always interfere with pregnancy. Depending on where they are in the uterus, mm -hmm. they play certain roles. So you can get fibroids which sit on the outside of the muscle of the uterus. They won't interfere with an embryo implanting. And then you can get a really small fibroid, which is deep in the muscle of the uterus, close to where the lining is, and that could interfere with the implantation of the embryo. And what we often see is that a woman will go to her gynecologist, find this big fibroid and take her to theatre and cut it out, but leave the big, the small fibroid which is close to the lining of the uterus and that is reducing her chances of falling pregnant. And then, we've, as kind of the years have progressed, we've come across another condition which is called adenomyosis, which essentially is endometriosis inside the muscle of the uterus. And when you have adenomyosis, it also will reduce the chances of an embryo implanting inside a uterus. So we, we make sure that we look for this, exclude it, and if we think it's there, treat it mm -hmm. in our patients who are having IVF to improve their chances of falling pregnant. We then get abnormalities in the shape of the uterus. So the uterus can develop, for example, with something called a septum or a heart shape where the middle of the uterus, which should have disappeared when a woman was in her mother's uterus, part of it can stay behind. And because that tissue shouldn't be there, an embryo that tries to implant on that, on that tissue may fail to implant and reduce the chances of a, of a pregnancy. Often those patients will present with things like miscarriage, um, but also can present with infertility related to that septum. And sometimes 
they can get pregnant, have a completely successful uneventful pregnancy, and then afterwards that septum starts to play a role because the rest of the pregnancies keep implanting on that area, and then we go and remove the septum and they fall pregnant. So we get congenital abnormalities of the uterus. We get acquired abnormalities in the uterus from things like surgery, that uh, uterus can develop scarring inside it which can prevent pregnancies from implanting. And then we get things that develop over time like polyps and fibroids and adenomyosis. And these are the kinds of things that we look for when we assess our patients. So how do you know if it's like a hereditary or genetic thing that you got from your mother or your grandmother or um, if it's something that existed or started due to like a DNC or something human damaged you know. so so <clears throat> a lot of the times you've got to as a doctor almost be a little bit of a detective so you listen to your patient and you listen to their story and sometimes they'll say you know what I felt pregnant had an easy pregnancy then I had a miscarriage and since then I haven't been able to fall pregnant or I had a baby and the placenta was stuck and it took me to theater to do a DNC and since then I haven't been able to fall pregnant and in that case you're more likely to find that this is an acquired condition from the DNC where, um, where if the gynecologist is a bit overzealous and scrapes the uterus too hard, they can cause scarring inside the uterus and the presence of the scar tissue will reduce the chances of falling pregnant. But if somebody comes to you and says, I've never been pregnant, I've never had a surgical procedure, and you assess the uterus and you find this abnormality in the shape, well then that's very likely to be a congenital abnormality. And then we can see the difference in, in when we go and do our assessments, be it by putting a little camera in the uterus and looking in to see what's causing the abnormality in the shape or doing an extra of the uterus. We can then look at it and see is this something that's acquired or congenital. If it's the way a woman's born, it's often quite symmetrical, whereas if it's surgical, we find that the scarring is in a random place in the uterus. Mm. Interesting. I myself had a septum in my okay. uterus, so it's very interesting to hear more information about it. So, Dr. Yulsi, what type of procedures would you do for a woman coming into your office? Um, what assessments do you do to pick up any of the abnormalities within the uterus? Good. So, again, we start off by listening to our patients. We ask them questions. What are your periods like? Sometimes a woman will say to you, I had normal periods and then I had a surgery and I haven't had periods since then, or my periods have been much lighter since then. Sometimes they'll say, suddenly my periods gone really heavy and when it was always normal, and then you worry about things like polyps and fibroids. So you listen to your patient and immediately when you're listening to your patient and you ask the right questions, you start to develop a little picture in your head about what you may see when you examine them. Then the examination is very important and the, the gynecologist's stethoscope is the ultrasound. So the physician walks around their, their office with the stethoscope around their shoulders and we have the ultrasound. The ultrasound is what we use to diagnose our patients and on ultrasound you should be able to pick up most of these pathologies. Looking at the muscle, looking at the thickness and the size of the uterus, looking at the thickness of the lining of the uterus, looking at the regularity if there's any breaks in the lining of the uterus. Picking up things like fibroids or polyps are really quite easy to do on an ultrasound if you really pay attention, take the time to look. But if you're unsure, there are other tests that we can do to augment the ultrasound. And one of the easiest tests to do is something called an HSG or a hysterosalpingogram where we inject a little bit of contrast or dye, we call it, into the uterus. And then we take an x-ray and as the dye fills up the uterus, it will show us if there's any filling defects or abnormalities in the shape. And then the gold standard of picking up uterine pathology is to do a, a hysteroscope. This can be done awake. We put a very thin little camera into the uterus. With a little bit of water, we dilate the uterus. And under vision, we can see the problem and plan on how we're going to address it. So one thing that came to my mind when you spoke about scarring and scar tissue growing due to surgeries and stuff. So say for instance you have these fibroids or you have a septum and you surgically remove these things. Do scar tissue not form now again after removing those? So that's, a, that's an excellent question. So <clears throat> there's a couple of um, facets to the answer. The one is that what we found is that the uterus that's pregnant, when there's a pregnancy in the uterus and you operate on that uterus, tends to heal quite badly. Whereas if you operate on a non-pregnant uterus, the healing is much better. So for example, the DNC, when 
when there's a pregnancy in the uterus will often lean, end up leading to a scar. But for some reason, gynecologists like to take patients for DNCs when they're not pregnant. If they just try to fall pregnant, they say, let's scrape that lining out and then <clears throat> start again on a new lining. And we don't see scarring result from that kind of procedure. The surgical technique is very important. So when you're taking out fibroids, depending on where the fibroids are, the goal is to not go into the uterine lining, to take the fibroid out without breaching the cavity of the uterus. And if you do breach the cavity of the uterus, to recognize it, and the way you repair the uterus will reduce the risk of scarring. The, the, the technique that we use to operate inside the uterus is very, very important. A lot of gynecologists will use cautery or electricity or diathermy inside the uterus, shaving polyps and fibroids away with a hot wire with an electricity running through it, something called a resectoscope. And these, these technologies tend to leave scarring in the uterus and they should be reserved for women who are no longer trying to have babies. So if you've got a woman who's in menopause who comes to you with a fibroid or a polyp, you can shave that out with your resectoscope, no problem. But if you've got somebody who still wants to have a baby in the uterus, the key is to operate with cold instruments. No electricity, no cautery in the uterus. And post the surgical procedure, we put our patients on a course of estrogen and progesterone, which encourages the healing of that lining, reduces the risk of post-operative scarring, so that you get a better result and not a worse result after the fact. And we see a lot of patients who go with very minimal pathology to their gynecologist, they have an operation and now they land up with significant pathology. So the way you treat the uterus is the way it will respond. Treat it kindly and it responds and heals really nicely. Thank you Dr. Yossi. Is there a take home message that you have for our viewers? So I think the, the take home message to, to two groups of women, because not, all, not only infertile women struggling with fertility will watch this video, and I think the key is if there's a change in your menstrual cycle and you are trying to fall pregnant, go and have a, an, 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 an ultrasound, go and see your gynecologist, see if there's something that's, that they can pick up that they can treat. In somebody who's struggling to fall pregnant, it's important not to get tunnel vision and forget about the uterus. Mm -hmm. IVF is relatively easy. To take eggs out of an ovary and to take sperm and make embryos, that's quite easy. Mm -hmm. When you put that embryo inside the uterus, you need to make sure that there's no reason why the embryo will, not fall, not fail, will fail to implant that you could have avoided. So make sure if there's adenomyosis, it should be treated. If there's fibroids, it should be treated. If there's polyps, mm -hmm. treat them. Don't waste one or two or three good embryos before you kind of start scratching your head and saying, well, why are these embryos failing to implant? Let's start to pay a bit more attention to the uterus. And it's easy to fix in most cases. So don't overlook it. Make sure that there isn't uterine pathology before doing your embryo transfer. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for watching. We look forward to our next episode, episode four.